Speed dating got me into a lot of trouble many, many years ago. In fact, uh, I, I had very little tact, no tact whatsoever, and so I met this lady and within moments we sort of decided we were born for each other. So we got married and very soon in the relationship she came home. She'd been out shopping and uh, she said, stay right there. She jumped into the room, put something on, came out, and she came out in this big dress. And she did a twirl. She said, tell me honestly, does this dress make my backside look big? <laughs> of course not, darling. Your backside's big with or without the dress. <laughs> <laughs> so for my second one. <laughs> I learned a little bit of tact, and, and what I did was, uh, she came home from a similar shopping trip, and she said, stay right there, I'm going to try some stuff off, and I want your honest opinion. She comes out in these blue jeans, tight hackers, and she says, do these blue jeans make my bum look like the side of our house? And I said, no, darling, ha, our house isn't blue. <laughs> but with my current partner, <laughs> Lovely lady, but just between us, because I know she's not in the room, and this doesn't leave the room. <laughs> not that long ago, she might have turned 40, and she was getting a bit concerned about how one looks when one turns 40. So she went out and she bought all this makeup and all this foundation stuff and all the eye and the gloss stuff, and she made herself. Oh. She said, I want you to stay here, I'm going to go into the bathroom, put it on, and when I come out, I'm going to ask you, and I want your honest opinion how old do you think I look? I said, oh, okay, I'm no worries. Said, and I'm sweating, I can't afford another one. <laughs> <laughs> she took about two hours to do all this stuff, and I'm thinking, well, she's aged two hours in the process. Let's not go there. And she comes out, and she, said, and she stands up, she comes right up, she says, right, Dad, how old? And I said, darling, if I was to go by your hair, 25. If I was to go by your eyes and your eyes alone, what, 26, 27? Your face, maybe 23. She said, stop it, you're making me blush. I said, don't interrupt me. I haven't added them up yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it takes a bit of a problem for me. <laughs> but ladies and gentlemen, our next speaker has no problems with hats. And she's, of course, Laurie Murphy. And uh, Laurie's going to be talking to us about supply chain under the auspices of quality of product. I mean, let's not forget this whole business session is about industry and innovation, as our two CEOs have said. Uh, Laurie has more than 38 years industry experience. He's worked in senior roles in wholesaling and in manufacturing. And CNW Electrical is the largest wholesaler in the VGW group. So we're pleased to have Laurie with us. Would you please welcome Laurie Murphy, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, David, and uh, uh, thanks very much, Master Electricians, for having me along today. I hope that uh, in the next short period of time, um, I can contribute a little bit, but uh, I'm sure that the speakers after me will be much better. But uh, the challenges today that we have, I'm going to try and work this thing. How do I work it this way? No? There we go. So today's supply chain is different to what it used to be. It's now boundless, it's borderless, and it's timeless. Traditionally, we had a, uh, we had a supply chain in our industry where we had electrical contractors buying from electrical wholesalers who purchased from suppliers who were manufacturers. And now it's totally different. We've got electrical contractors, we've got builders, we've got consultants, we've got consumers, we've got integrators buying from electrical wholesalers, buy, buying from Amazon, buying from eBay, buying from Google Shop, uh, buying direct. Uh, and then those companies are buying from agents, our suppliers no longer necessarily make the product. They uh, actually use other factories to make the product. So the whole supply chain is delaminated. And uh, that causes us um, a lot of angst and a lot of, uh, uh, of challenges in trying to manage the process in quality product and getting the quality product to you guys because we're not fully in control of that chain. So our responsibility and all wholesalers' responsibilities is is to uh, <clears throat> be responsible for the safety, the integrity, and the quality of the product from the factory all the way to when you guys install it and beyond. You know, the consumer has an expectation that the stuff that you're installing is quality, uh, is lasting, and it's not dangerous. You know, I think that if cable was a tight hand, uh, people would be taking a lot different notice on it, and uh, it has the same features of a tight hand, it can kill you. So, um, 
So we just got to we got to improve what we do. I guess our company. So I'm going to try. It. Very good. No, it's not working. So. So our, our company, for our company, safety is end end. We we started as a very small business, and um, and if I can get it going, there you go. Um, our conferences were uh, held around Eskies or, or chili bins for the New Zealanders, and our safety program that I used to say was I just say to the managers, make sure you've got your shit right because I ain't going to be going to jail playing mums and dads with Big Bubba. It'll be your problem. <laughs> But as time went on, we realised that uh, safety was critical and we had to uh, engage some policies um, so, and create culture. And how do we do that? Um, naturally, it's all about people. And the engagement of people, we are a people business. It's about our policies, it's about our processes, and it's about participation at all levels in the supply chain. So we had to engage and, and work with um, our suppliers and get our suppliers to understand who we are. We had to engage our employees and make sure that they understood what the policy was and what the process was in how we procure equipment because effectively, you know, in our business we've got about 130 branches and in those 130 branches uh, you've got a number of decision makers who've all got order books and you need policy and procedures to control that. So, um, so we implemented it. The thing that was probably the biggest deal for us and in our safety the greatest concern I ever had was about motor vehicles. So, you know, we've got about 800 motor vehicles on the road, um, and, and, it, and it occurred. One uh, Christmas Eve, we had a young fellow, 19 years old, doing a delivery in Adelaide, head on into a truck. And so, um, I don't know if any of you have experienced that in business, but it is not a very nice experience. And um, so, and that time of year, so the day after Boxing Day, I fronted Workplace South Australia. Um, and it's, uh, it was very, very testing. I had my manager with me and that branch manager was very close to the board. So he was quite emotional. And the interrogation that went on was as though, you know, we were responsible for this accident. And one of the questions asked was, could the, could the boy drive? And the manager was quite emotional and he, he said, of course he could drive, he's got a license. He said, that doesn't mean he can drive. Um, and uh, fortunately, what happened that morning is that manager happened to be in that car with that, with that boy. And, uh, that was enough evidence for WorkSafe South Australia to say that he was a competent driver and the vehicle was competent. But I don't know how we would have got on had we not been in that. So, you know, we now implement with our managers, you know, think about it as, oh, it's your wife's car. The only way you're going to know whether it's any good is drive it. So, um, so, you know, we do that now as one of our processes. But that was something in our business that changed our culture. Um, the emotion of losing someone made us then really stick to the policy and stick to the procedures. So, um, so that works, it's working quite well for us. I guess, uh, next one, we, um, the relationships in the supply chain um, for us uh, are critical. We see our suppliers as, uh, as important as our staff and our customers, and on some occasions probably more important. We entertain our suppliers on purpose because that they are critical to our success. <coughs> they need to be more than a partner with us. Um, they need to be part of our business, you know, and I don't know whether your suppliers understand your business. Our business is complex, it's diverse, so we have to spend time educating our, our suppliers to understand what's our culture, how do we operate, what's our service criteria, what do we do in, in engaging. So, you know, we need to have them engage with us at all levels, and we need to understand what you as customers want, what your processes and functions are. We need our, you know, our deliveries, our, our transport companies to understand who we are and what we do because it's in our game, you know, from Wheatstone in Northern Australia to the Tangas in the Philippines to Chilkat in Indonesia to Belmain in Sydney, it's all different. And we need to make sure that our suppliers and, and our, and our um, transport companies are working with us and, you know, building trust and working together to maintain it. You know, I was saying to Tony before, trust is like a tree. You know, it takes a long time to grow, but it doesn't take too long to knock it down. So, um, so we're going to keep working on that. Next one. So, uh, what we've implemented in our business is an audit process. And so we now audit our suppliers, and uh, we audit them on safety and QA. We audit them on their ethics. We audit them on their environment. We audit, the, audit them on their company structure. We want to know are they a $2 pay-up company? Have they got a lot of employees? How long have they been around? 
We order them on their, order them on their insurance. What levels of insurance do they have in supporting the supply chain? What their staff are? You know, what their manufacturing is. You know, we do a lot of work in the oil and gas industry. And oil and gas industries have what they call approved vendor list, ADLs. And once upon a time, those ADLs were about brand. So it would be the brand that would be the approved ADL. It is now the factory that's the approved ADL. So they won't um, hypothetically use a, a, a brand like an Olex cable. They want to know what factory it's made from and they approve that factory. And we want to understand their logistics. So the interesting statistic about this is that we've um, conducted 275 of these audits have gone out to our suppliers. We've had 40 return, and of those, only two have product recall insurance. So what, what we're dealing with here is, and I think for large companies like NHP or Schneider or these guys, they've got a balance sheet sufficient to be able to support a problem. But um, for two out of 40, and I'm assuming two out of 275, um, to have product recall insurance, it's a bit damning for us. So, uh, but that's what we're doing. We'd like to be able to have that online. We'd like to be able to show it up so that all you guys could go online and see who, who does this well, who operates well. Um, and I think as an industry, all the wholesalers, it would be great for us to have a central deposit of information that could be, uh, you know, can be reviewed so that we know who we're dealing with. One of the big problems we're seeing is consultants are driving, they're driving what sort of light fittings are going into buildings, but then without any accountability thereafter. So, you know, we often have contractors coming to us saying we've got to get this type of light fitting, and we don't want to do it. Um, and we're now seriously thinking about um, putting in indemnities so that if a contractor comes to us and wants us to go and source light fittings that we know aren't right, We'll get them to sign an indemnity and hopefully they'll get their, con their builder to sign an indemnity. But um, that's where it's been driven from because the accountability isn't all the way through the supply chain. I think the other challenge for us is technology and where technology is going. So, uh, we go to the next one, thanks, Nicole. So, you know, already, uh, and technology is going so quickly, already these things are available. This is uh, the ingestible device that goes into the wall of your stomach that's powered by the stomach acids that senses and detects the, all the functions of the organs in your body and then can transmit that data to whoever, whoever would require it. So can you imagine me having that in my stomach on Saturday night? The doctor would be going, Murphy, get off the piss, your liver's screaming, your blood pressure's through the roof, but this technology's here today. It's here and available today. So next slide. You know, the other thing is uh, we, we hear a lot about driverless, right? This car here was built and completed in 2015, Mercedes-Benz. So uh, a driverless car. Um, you know, there's a driverless taxi in Singapore now. So I struggle to get in the car with my wife driving. I haven't yet got the guts to get her money, but there's no one driving. You know? <laughs> what, is, what does that look like for us into the future? Does it look like for you guys that you're going to... Uh, you're going to have driverless trucks turning up with your gear? How is all that going to change? We don't know, but technology is having an enormous impact on where we're going and what we're doing. So, um, we'll just go to the next one, please. Um, the augmentation age, communication. You know, these things here. And only been around nine years, okay? Um, amazing what, what this has done in nine years. You know, the other interesting thing about that is you notice no one ever really uses anybody else's phone. And the reason is that 83% of the population, when they get up in the morning, take their phone to the toilet to check their messages, right? So, um, but this is, this, this is now augmented in society. Robots are augmented in society. You know, robots, they're very, very close now to having the eyes right in robots. Everything else is right, the skin, they, they've developed all that stuff. And once they can get the eye right, because they got the artificial intelligence right, they've got the communication right. America's now, they're, they're now uh, looking at having robots as nurses so that a robot can hold conversation, can take ops, and can sit beside the patient the whole time. Um, so what's that going to mean to us? Am I going to have robots in their stores? Are you guys going to have robots fitting PowerPoints off? Um, it's changing and it's changing quickly and it's something for us in the supply chain to understand better. Relevance. I think that, you know, for electrical wholesaling, that's critical. Because if we're not relevant, we're not here. And we've got to continue to work out the ways of relevance. And undoubtedly, product quality, product integrity, 
and the product supply is the most important part of our relevance. So, um, but that's something that's very important to us in the future. The other challenges for us is, you know, we've got multiple states, multiple laws, multiple countries. So you've got to understand and, and you've got to know what's required in, in every different country, in every different state, and what the regulations are. And, you know, for the life of me, I don't understand why we don't have one Malcolm right across our country, and I'm not too sure what it's like in New Zealand, but, uh, you know, um, to have so many different regulators and, and not being able to agree because of egos and all these sorts of things, it's, uh, it's a bit crazy as far as products concerned. Third party for a third party, we do import product. Um, but, uh, you know, what's critical for me is that I have someone else outside our business and outside who we're dealing with who's checking. So, uh, we're, and we've got a company based out of Hong Kong that checks all our supplies. So we order factories, we make sure the factories are right, um, and they're, they're actually a British owned company who have a lot of Asians working for them, and uh, it's called Asian Quality Focus. And they go and order every part of our, uh, who we're dealing with, because we, you know, we don't trust them. So, um, and then as far as our freight's concerned, you know, the, the logistics part of our business is massive. So we have a third party that manages our freight so that uh, we then don't have to um, spend all that time educating and training all the freight companies, the third party does it for us. And then the biggest challenge I think for us in the supply chain is speed. So in our plumbing business, what I've noticed, we have retail showrooms in the plumbing business and yesteryear they, uh, the, the, the consumer would come in and be happy to wait for the product, they're not anymore. They're looking at it online, they're coming in, they want to feel it, they want to get it that day. You know, online trading has, has created a lot of speed, but what it's done is reduced range. So you, you're seeing sites where you're going on and you can, you can get gear, but those sites are sometimes 600 products, sometimes 1,000 products. In our business, in electrical, we've got about 65,000 products. So, um, so, you know, it's a changing world, and this speed is going to continue to go. It's got, the world will get faster and faster, and our, us in the supply chain, our challenges are to make it safe whilst it's fast. So um, I hope that helps you a little bit. That's, uh, I'm, I'm sure the speakers will get a lot better as the day goes on. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks for your time.